<laughs> well, thank you, uh, Gunnar and uh, Carl and uh, Lisa, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is an amazing day. Uh, it's amazing in part because I'm here at all, but here at a time when there has been an election in the United States that's had such an extraordinary consequence and unique historical event of a new president who is a black American. Now I raise this as a, the beginning of my talk because it's at the heart of the kind of discoveries that I've been involved in with Carl and with others uh, here at the Bear and at the uh, Stockholm uh, Resilience Center for at least, I think, it must be 20 years. And what I'd like to do in my uh, brief presentation is first of all review some of the work that uh, led to this, these ideas and theories of change that are given the word uh, resilience. I want to show how those ideas and theories have been tested in two different ways. One a, very, a more traditional scientific way and more, one a more subjective way. <coughs> and I want to end <coughs> talking about the transformations in the world now that are taking place and what we might do as partners in those changes. So the work itself started essentially 35 years ago when I was uh, developing one of the early models, computer-based models, simulation models of predator-prey interactions. That work came out of a, about a five to ten year program of experimental uh, 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 work on understanding uh, the various kinds of predation that occur in the world, all the way from bacteria to literally people and submarines and what have you. And out of that experimental work, that was driven by a desire to have precision and some generality and holism, out of it came a representation of predation that fell into about four principal categories. Each category of predation uh, having different stability properties. So I got to that point uh, and decided then that perhaps we should make a run at it and try developing a population model that would interact simulated predators and simulated prey. And there's Uno Svedin, who's welcome, <laughs> uh, uh, on, a, on an old, uh, what was called an IBM 1130, which was programmed with great stacks of cards and, and took hours to generate what now would be generated in minutes. <coughs> And I remember vividly the first run of that model, runs of that model. And it actually stunned me because the first runs said there are regions in this interaction between the two populations where it's stable, where the two popula populations interact, ending up at a stable limit cycle or a stable point. But there are other regions, lo and behold, in which one or the other goes extinct. Now that came to me as being stunning because I was affected, as much of our uh, people of my age was, by the paradigm and theoretical foundations of ecology at that time, which was essentially a homeostatic regulation. That is, like uh, uh, homeothermy in a, in an organ in a warm-blooded organism with a temperature being regulated at around a certain uh, temperature. And all the emphasis in my training was dominated by this idea of an equilibrium, equilibrium condition, and events near that equilibrium. But this model was saying, while that is true, there is also something else happening. There's a limited range over which those stabilizing forces operate. 
And in fact, what's as important as the equilibrium and near equilibrium conditions, equally important is the uh, uh, conditions at the edge of that stability domain where the system can flip from being in one state to being in another. Now that came to me, honestly, as just, uh, well, I, it was turning, a, 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 it created for me a new paradigm. And now suddenly, in things like regulation of uh, population numbers in, in harvesting fish or, or forests or, or grasslands, came the realization that variability itself in ecosystems was more important than constancy. That a command and control approach that would manage a population of fish, say, so as to produce a maximum sustained yield, you know, with relatively little uh, fluctuation, could in its success create the conditions for the collapse of the organism being managed. That's what happened in the cod in Newfoundland. The very success of achieving the stabilization of a population near an equilibrium through control of fishing and whatnot means that the natural system and its diversity can begin to evolve. That the diversity that maintains the system in the stability region can begin to shrink. Same is true of salmon on the west coast of, of uh, North America. Uh, salmon populations, natural salmon populations, have been dramatically restricted over the last century. And now it's dependent upon a, smooth, a small number of uh, uh, surviving fisheries, uh, surviving stocks, rather, and as well as enhanced uh, uh, facilities. The shrinkage of that diversity, spatial, ecological, biological, means that the system can begin to get close to the edge of that stability region, unknown to the people who are doing the management. So here was an interesting situation where the success of management could lead to the shrinkage of the domain of stability such that it would cross the populations, causing the collapse. And that, in fact, is what has occurred in a number of resource circumstances. <coughs> so the idea of this uh, multi-stable state began to be dominant. In looking at the causes of it, it began to be apparent that the causes, as revealed by these experimental, experimental work, the causes seemed to me to be literally universal. That every ecosystem would have these properties, which were properties seen when densities of organisms were low, certain nonlinearities would appear that would produce this uh, destabilization. So I got to this point. And for 30 years, it stayed there, really, because it was extreme. While it, was, uh, it had been already demonstrated by good scientific foundation, the experimental reality of these nonlinearities, it was another thing to establish the fact that the flips, in fact, do occur in nature. And that when they occur, they persist, and returning them back to the original uh, configuration is very difficult. That took about 20, 25 years with work by people like Steve Carpenter in the University of Wisconsin and Martin Schaefer in Europe in the freshwater lakes, uh, shallow lakes, until they were able to demonstrate that, yes, indeed, these instabilities, these flips from one state to another, do occur in these variety of ecological situations. And to return the situation back to the way it was, was not a straightforward single variable manipulation, but typically would require one to manipulate three or four sets of variables that could then bring the system back to where it was. About this time, it became apparent, too, that another dimension of the story required the notion of an adaptive cycle, that these changes and how do I get this thing? It's right there. Oh, it's right there. <laughs> OK. Uh, there was an adaptive cycle 
that equally, in, as shown in this metaphor, you can start with a population or a, a system at one stage in exploitation, say a field. The uh, organisms present in that field were competing and be able to survive uh, extremes of climate and the weather, and gradually as they grew, grew, begin to sequester slowly more and more resources to end up at some conservation phase with a mature forest. That front loop, exploitation to conservation, is a slow, gradual process of accumulating resources. If one was to think of learning, this would be a phase of incremental learning of the system. At the top of that, uh, that conservation phase, the system is now bound up and controlled by a small number of variables. In the boreal forests of North America, for example, there's about three different species of trees. Uh, spruce fir, <coughs> pioneer species, there's birch and whatnot, just as you see out here. <coughs> so the system becomes bound up and controlled by a small number of variables. Now I use the word phrases carefully, bound up and controlled, means external species have little chance of entering. But it is also a stage that is most fragile. It is the stage where the resilience has gradually contracted, such that it becomes an accident waiting to happen. The accident might get the name fire, forest fire, might get the name spruce budworm outbreak, but a, a small-scale event, a, a spark in the floor of the forest, a, a budworm population in a tree, can explode and dominate and, and uh, 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 destroy uh, not just acres, but multiple acres of forest. In so doing, it slipped, the forest slips into the back loop, where the accumulated resources now are no longer bound up. Now suddenly there's great resilience. Now is the time when unexpected events happen. In a simplistic way, that's where we are now internationally. The fiscal crisis that has emerged in the United States and has spread internationally has, I would argue, begun immediately after the Second World War in a slow, incremental process of accumulating resources to the, uh, and to the development of, of actions and policies to try to manage the instabilities as, as maturity developed, to the point where the system was essentially being controlled in a completely invisible way, completely growing to be an accident waiting to happen. 70, what, five years or something after it began. The break is what Schwertfeger, the, the Aust, um, Austrian economist, called creative destruction. Great phrase. It is destruction in that the accumulated resources are disassembled, are broken down, are left uncontrolled. It's creative because that's the time when the unexpected can occur and un small scale unexpected combinations can synergize to in initiate the next swing of the cycle. How, how many more minutes have I got? You have 16. Okay, excellent. Uh, so, uh, so let me pause then, having planted that thought in your mind. And let me just briefly indicate why I'm making this journey from describing an ecosystem in a region to applying it to the international economic sphere. So I pause and I talk about the proofing of such an idea. There were two sets of proofs. One set had to do with establishing that there was a hierarchy of these adaptive cycles from the leaves in the trees to the, the, the foliage of the tree to the competitive interactions in, a, in a, a group of trees to the stand to the forest and what have you. And one of the tests that occurred to me 
was that such a scheme, if it was real, should generate a pattern of distribution of attributes of organisms that was lumpy. That is, there would be a bunch of things happening at a small scale, then a break, and then a bunch of things happening at a somewhat larger scale. And you would probably get, the theory was, the hypothesis was, maybe five or six of these groupings of organisms. So I tested that by turning to the easily available data of the time, which was essentially body sizes of various mammals and birds and other organisms in the boreal, for, uh, boreal forest and boreal region prairies. And lo and behold, it turned out that way. They were not uniformly distributed as uh, traditional paradigms of continuous behavior would indicate, but rather lumpily distributed. Moreover, it was discovered by one of my graduate students that the organisms on the edge of those body mass clumps were the ones that were disproportionately either invasive species or endangered species. Tremendously interesting, because suddenly now you had two bodies of independently determined data that were reinforcing each other. When the arguments began to develop about this, which they immediately did, a good friend, a Nobel laureate at, uh, um, at, the, um, at the Santa Fe Institute, suggested, well, bring the enemies together and the friends together, and we'll have some other people, and we'll talk about it. So we did that, and out of it came a conviction that it was real, an agreement with a group of people to go out independently and get their own data and test the same ideas, which they did, and all confirming the whole bloody thing. The book has just appeared and it's called Discontinuous Behavior in Complex uh, Ecosystems. But the other test was equally important, and that was a more subjective test. And that was to turn to the group of people we were now working with in what was called the, the Resilience Project that Carl Joran and I uh, headed up out of the Bayer Institute. Uh, and what we did in this project, the goal, was to search for an integration between economic theory and ecological theory. The argument was that each was contributing something special, the other one was not, and a combination might be more broadly insightful and deeply insightful. So in that grouping of people that we had, we went through, uh, I don't know, maybe 40 workshops around the world, it turned out that the people who were inspired by the notion of mutual discovery, you know, coming from different disciplines, background, and inspired by getting an idea from another fellow that reinforced some version of an idea they had and then going on, that joy of mutual discovery turned out to be a powerful force for testing these ideas. There were something like 300 people went through these various workshops. Out of it came about 30 who were, as we described them, good on islands. We met on islands in every instance. And the ones who were good on islands were the ones that could drink hard, play hard, and work hard. So that at the end of five days, you say, ah, I want to get back together with those folks. And they're the ones that ended up being authors of the, the book that came out of it called Panarchy that Lance Gunderson and I co-edited. Four of those people agreed to test the idea in their own system. I did not dare to do that because I don't know enough about economics or social sciences or even aquatic systems, let alone semi-arid uh, grassland systems, to, to with confidence say this was a scheme appropriate to all of them. But it ended up with Buzz Brock, a well-known nonlinear uh, uh, economist, uh, Steve Carpenter, extremely well-known aquatic ecosystem ecologist, uh, Brian Walker, knows arid ecosystems in Australia inside out, and Francis Wesley, who was our expert in uh, nonlinear social organizational systems. Basically, they tested it all out, and they said, yeah, this is appropriate language. This theory of change, panarchy, resilience, adaptive cycle, 
is a language appropriate to our systems. So if it's appropriate to our systems, it must have something to say about this break that's occurred over the last month or so. There couldn't have been a better time to have been awarded the uh, Volvo uh, Environmental Prize as today. <laughs> there couldn't have possibly been a better time. <laughs> because here we are. We're, we're poised right at that moment of creative destruction where the creati creativity and the hope is being generated by uh, Senator uh, Barack Obama and his wise advisors at a critical moment in the history of that great country. As a Canadian, I've lived next to the U.S. for my 78 years. And I've viewed the United States as a, a, a puzzled admirer of an almost operatic society. Operatic in, operatic in its extremes and its music. We went down there, Elsa and I, about 12 years ago, because something happened that is so typical in the United States. A phone call that said, how about coming down and taking this chair, which has uh, four, four, uh, $2 million donated to it, to uh, underwrite the research. And there was a tremendous opportunity, the sudden freedom to do investigations that were not really being, not, not that they weren't being supported. Well, they weren't. I couldn't get support for them in Canada at that time. Now, you could. But at that time, it was a wonderful opportunity to fly again. Uh, and the Resilience Project came out of that freedom. So what should one do now? Well, a lot of what's happening now is exactly what we would suggest from, the, from this panarchical collapse theory, that is, control the extremes in the banking and international system. That's fine. Second thing, also good, um, put some controls uh, over the people who are blocking innovation. That's very important. And the third thing is to recognize that we're moving into regimes of the unknown, of the literally unknown, not just uh, unexpected, not just uncertain, but fundamentally unknown. Now, when you're faced with a situation where there are deep unknowns, the only thing you can possibly do is experiment, propose ideas, novel ideas, and begin to test them in action. So what I was arguing yesterday with the Volvo group was now for the time was the time for Volvo, faced even as it is with a third uh, cut in workforce, to spawn a partner to our Resilience Alliance. Now the Resilience Alliance is a group of 17, uh, is an association of 17 groups around the world, communicate via the internet, uh, a small fee to be, become part of it, a lot of energy, novelty, uh, young people, the, the Rays group, uh, the, the Victor Gallants will be speaking about it, in fact. Uh, a diverse group which meet every 15 months, roughly, on an island somewhere. They'll meet next year, uh, on an island that chosen by Ilsa, my dear wife, who is the conference dragon of, of my, my group. <laughs> um, we need a comparable, okay, we need it, I've got three minutes. We need a comparable group to the Resilience Alliance. One that has an association, say of Volvo, it has to have some business. Um, I suggested to Volvo then 
a partnership with the Stockholm Resilience Center, with the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics, and with the Resilience Alliance, at the minimum, an association of groups who have an international outlook and whose first job would be to invite proposals for large-scale experiments. Experiments that had to do with exploiting the fact that the climate is changing and the reestablishment of diversity in the Scandinavian Finnish forests could be facilitated through establishing managed corridors and what have you. Other things with, with salmon on the west coast, with, with solar power in Cedar Key where we used to live and so on. A number of experiments that the group then would review the proposals and then would select some, maybe 10, that would, in their view, be dramatic examples of new experiments that link across the spatial conflicts and, and, and barriers that now exist, knowing that probably 10 to 20% of those will fail. But the others, if they begin to show seeds of success, could then perhaps synergize to define a new territory that is emerging. That's exactly what happens in that back loop. Exactly that process where the individual or small groups of individuals can begin to unexpectedly interact to pro propagate something completely novel. Next slide, what do we do? Uh, I will end up with the last picture. <laughs> So there it is, more, uh, that, yeah, okay, now let me end up. This is a picture showing the two experiments that I've tried at the social level. The one that fails is represented by the, the cormorant in the background. It's actually one cormorant in a threat posture because I was threatening the bureaucrats who were trying to control this particular experiment in the lower mainland of Vancouver. Of, of, uh, of Vancouver. The front object is representative of the Resilience Alliance. A great success, and why is that a great success? Because totally unexpectedly it produced novel institutions on the Barrier Reef, the Stockholm uh, Resilience Center, the Social Innovation Center of Francis Wesley in Canada, novel groups that suddenly emerged, not, not through external planning, but suddenly appeared because of the magic of the interaction that was allowed. That has been a great success. And all I'm recommending now is we establish another partner organization that involves business to achieve the same thing. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Buzz Holling, for taking us through this fascinating journey through uh, resilience theory evolution. Um, you're a great inspiration to me and to many researchers across the world, so I'm really happy for you to have this prize. Um, but I have one little question for you. <laughs> you say that uh, creative destruction is, is part of the cycle that all living systems go through and that this release phase creates the opportunity for the system to go through yet another round of this cycle. Now, in the light of this, do you think that it is possible for the human population to avoid collapse on a global scale? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Try it. Thank you.